Baptist Church. Good morning. We're going to have a pretty long service today. So, uh, on our announcements, I want you to take a look that today we have our quarterly business meeting uh, after the service. And um, we have Operation um, Christmas Child thing. We're going to have a short video on that after I do the announcements and the opening prayers. Um, normally, I have uh, Psalm 73, but if anybody's looked at the Psalms, that's a long psalm. And since we're going to be pretty busy this morning, I took it that I'm going to go into the fifth book of Psalms, and I've decided that we're going to have Psalm 108, verses 1 through 5. So if you've got your Bible open, please go to Psalm 108, verses 1 through 5. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens, and faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be all over. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please be with us here today as we get into the last quarter of this year. Please uh, answer the prayers of all of us that we're praying for in your time. Be with the pastor this morning as he brings us your word. May it be ingested and may it be digested. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Moises Grosso, and I'm from El Salvador. I actually don't know much about my own country uh, because I was in an orphanage in the middle of nowhere, and that's where I grew up. Every Sunday after church service, it was family day for, for those who had parents. Every year, I waited, and I'm not having them visit me, so I always ask myself, if I wasn't good enough for my parents, would I ever be good enough for anyone else? So that day, we were told that there were going to be people coming to our homes to bring us gifts. They kept repeating the phrase, Jesus loves you. Uh, I started to walk away when a man motions me back, and um, he, he tells me, where are you going? You don't have a shoebox yet. And I quickly replied, but I don't have any parents. And um, that's when he looked directly into my eyes and with a smile on his face, he just hands me the shoebox and he tells me, Jesus loves me. As I received it, I kept looking at it and I started to walk away. And I looked back to see if the man was going to come back and take the shoebox back. But he did it. And he knew what I was thinking, so he just smiled and waited for everybody to have a moment to open the shoebox. That day was just full of joy. So my wow wagon was a, a soccer boy, and I couldn't believe that it was mine. Um, that I just remember opening it and receiving a soccer boy, and I just remember just playing in the orphanage. We had a big field to play on, and I just remember running with the soccer ball all, all over the orphanage. So it was that moment when I realized that I was loved and I was seen. With my shoebox, I also received the greatest gift booklet, and that, that's when my prayer journey began. And I started to pray for a family. When I was 10 years old, I was called into the office of the orphanage and I was told that there was going to be a family in the United States who wanted to adopt me. And I was introduced to my adopted family and I just remember running to them and calling them familia. Now I live my life saying yes to it because I have no reason to say no. He did not just give me a family, but he gave me a new life.
Jesus.
Good morning. Good morning. Before I forget, uh, Gloria, it is your birthday. Is it your birthday? Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyways, um, I wanted to share with you a short little video of something. If this is kind of like the trailer to what I'm going to show you Wednesday night, if you come Wednesday night. Um, and I preface this because, you know, we've been teaching on kind of uh, uh, kingdom politics and how we are to think and, and, and act biblically as Christians in regards to voting and coming out in the upcoming elections, different things like that. Um, and what the video I'm going to show you is, I, I press it, is because it's a little disturbing uh, as what is uh, coming in our educational system. Uh, these days, and uh, and so I don't have time to show you the whole thing uh, here, but I do on Wednesday. So if you come on Wednesday, and I will let you see more of it uh, if you want to see it. So I just encourage you, Jen, if you would go ahead. And it means I know God. That's what it means. And for you to have a policy that says that in this meeting you're against vulgarity, then it means this boy is a hypocrite if you endorse books like this to be in the school system. They can't make me leave. I have freedom of speech. And you are supposed to uphold that. I think there's men and women that are ignorant of our educational system. They're still thinking that this is like when I went to school. If they think that a 14-year-old should be reading this in school, we have a serious problem. Are there any other books? There are hundreds and hundreds. God never intended for the church to be hid in a corner. That's not what God called us to do. We're supposed to occupy until it comes, but we do that standing. If you pervert the hearts and the minds of kids in this district, you will reap it. I'm disgusted. What a shame you all are. How do you define the leftist and domination? A communist leader is at the heart of about dividing society, dividing parents from children, male and female, whatever the case may be. And once you're educated, you can fight it. Your time's up. My time is not up. I'm not leaving. You want to know why I'm not leaving? Because I came too far to defend these children in this
because I entitled uh, the message today, I think, True Religion. Um, and here's your, here's your word for the day if you don't know it all that Here's a Greek word, and I'll give you two in the English spelling, uh, but it's the word aletheia. And you say, what does that mean? Well, in the Greek, it means truth. Okay? And it's spelled A-L-E-T-H-I-A. That's the Greek spelling for it, okay? Aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-I-A. In John chapter, uh, John chapter, 18, when Jesus is in Pilate's court being questioned by Jesus just prior to his crucifixion, he says, he has a number of things. He's questioning Jesus about who he is, right? And in that statement, uh, in that questioning, he comes to verse 36, where Jesus answered him, um, and says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered from the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. The pale Pilate responds to him in this, and he says, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, this is John 18, 37. You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Then the first response that Pilate has is what? Pilate turns to him and says, what is truth? He basically walks away. From the very embodiment of truth, right before him, he turns away from it. And it's what many do in this world today. The Greek word translated truth, as I said, is aletheia, which most closely resembles our English word reality. And when I was in, uh, in seminary and apologetics, that's one of the things that we did. Everyone can have their truth, you know, they can say, well, this is true for me, but it may not be true for you. And you have your truth, and everybody has their truth, and it's kind of a product of our postmodern philosophy that that truth is relative, that there's no absolute overarching absolute truth to which we all are, are answerable or succumb to. But that is not corresponding to reality. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Can I verify what you claim? Same thing with Christianity. Christianity stands or falls on the truth of the resurrection, right? If we cannot test it, then we are, as Paul said, Paul said, of all men most visible, if it's not true. One of the reasons that so few people find the courage to stand up for values like the rights of life or other biblical or political issues of today is due to the separatist or schisms that exist even within the church. When a person feels alone in his or her beliefs, it can become harder to be a voice for truth. It's very easy to stand when you've got a bunch of people on your side backing you up to stand for something, right? But when sometimes you have to stand all alone, that's another story. Just try coming up here. <laughs> okay? And while freedom, uh, while freedom of religion is a great thing, I'm afraid our society and even the church has migrated to freedom from religion, as well as a freedom of divergent religious beliefs, which leads to different denominations to be offered on every corner. You know, I thought for a second about that when our country was founded, as we've been going through politics and everything a little bit and, and stuff. When our country was founded, it was primarily Protestant Christian, right? I remember D.J. Kennedy saying it was a 90, in 1776, it was 98.6% Protestant Christian. Okay? And Christianity gives the freedom for that freedom of, of thought and belief. They wanted that. That was one of the primary reasons why they came to this new world, was the freedom to worship as they chose fit. 
because there wasn't a state religion. There wasn't a mandated that you had to be this or that, right? They wanted that freedom because that's what the Bible taught, right? You see some, sometimes you see bumper stickers on cars, and you might see it when you leave today, uh, that term coexistence, you know? And it's uh, got the symbols of the various world religions on it and stuff and everything. And in one sense, I can appreciate that. That is good. But at the same time, you have to understand that at some point, every religion has its exclusive its exclusivity that separates it from all other belief systems. And what we have to come do, what we ought to do, what we are taught to do, what we are told to do as Christians is to research what is the truth, okay? And evaluate what someone claims to be true with what is reality. Christianity in our nation, when it was founded, as I said, served as a backdrop to religious freedom and practice. I was thinking about this also in relationship to the practice of, of Islam in this country. You know, there are pockets of, of Muslim communities uh, in this in this country. Nowadays, primarily, I think of the ones in here, Dearborn, Michigan, and stuff and everything, other places where they are just, you know, kind of taking over that community. You know, and trying to insert their law, Sharia law, in, in that area. They have the freedom to do that in this world on the backdrop of the freedom of religion in this country that we have. Okay? I'm not going to talk about the right and wrong of everything going on there right now, but I'm saying they have that right in this country, and they're not persecuted or taxed or threatened with, with their life if they you know, uh, continue to practice the way they believe. However, if you were to go to a Muslim country and you are a Christian, you're going to either pay a tax to be a Christian and practice your beliefs in that country, and usually that's only for a period of time because they don't want you doing that. Because it, it can come down to the idea of you either convert to what they believe or not. You know, there's not religious freedom in that. We have a religious freedom that we take for granted in this country. I'm afraid that if we keep going on the path that we're going, there's going to come a time when we're not going to have that freedom that we enjoy today. I have heard stories throughout, even in this country, of pastors being arrested or teaching some of the things that I've been teaching in the last few uh, couple months, threatened to be arrested and taken to jail because of what they what they are teaching that the Bible says, right? The truth. I ran across. Uh, uh, I get the uh, Voice of the Martyrs uh, magazine uh, periodically, and I wanted to encourage you guys. Start. I'll probably post this uh, up to a little flyer uh, here that says. Uh, the International Day of Prayer for Persecuted Christians, Sunday, November 3rd. And so I'm, I'm going to probably post that up just to encourage you to put it on a prayer list uh, to be praying for Christians around the world. Because uh, in this last century, probably the last hundred years or so, Christians have been persecuted around the world more than any other century since Christ. Okay. Um, we don't think about that. We think, well, we're civilized, we're modern, we're, you know, uh, comfortable in the freedom that we have today, but, but around the world, Christians are persecuted um, continuously. And Richard Wormbrand started a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs, and this was written some time ago, but I just want to read a little bit about what he said. He says, run, he titled this little article, he says, run after him. And he takes it from the Song of Solomon of all places. How many preachers going to preach on the Song of Solomon? Chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 4, you know. But he says, draw me after you, let us run. Let me read just a little bit for you. He says, we must not walk after the Lord, but run. The writer of Hebrews tells believers to run with endurance in Hebrews 12. The Apostle Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners 
run, right? Let me just stop for a second, Christian. I don't know what physical or spiritual or mental obstacles you may have in your life. But as a Christian, in your relationship with the Lord, you are to go at it with everything that God has given you, with all to the best of your ability. In essence, like Paul would say, we are to run. And you say, I can't run. Well, like physically, you might not be able to. But spiritually, you may be able to take off and just and, and, and pray for those around you in a sense that you are, in essence, running. He goes on and he says, do you know that, that in, uh, in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Running symbolizes a longing for God and a vigorous faith in Him. Psalms 119, 32 says, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. I like that. This Psalms 119, 32, if you want to read, look it up. But at the end of this little article, I'll read all of it for you, but at the end of this article, he says, In the underground church, pastors give assignments to church members that might result in their death. The underground church where freedom of religion is not present, okay, to follow Christ is like the early church. You're putting a target on your back, okay? And in the underground church where freedom... To, to practice Christianity and, and follow Christ as we know we ought to is condemned and criticized and, and at best tolerated like in some Muslim countries as I just mentioned. They ask them to organize secret printing presses and transport Christian literature from place to place. These believers, if they're caught, at best they'll go to prison. At worst, they'll be killed. Because of those printing presses, many people have died. And yet they continue to say, here, take this. Why? Because they know the truth needs to be shared. He says, our mission has sent couriers into communist and Islamic countries to smuggle Christian books. One of them was beaten to death in China. Others were wounded while taking Bibles into Mozambique when it was under communist influence. Soul winners in the underground church cannot be complacent. Cannot be complacent. See, we have a complacency in our society because of the freedom that we have. We are not threatened with our lives, so therefore we kind of choose when and how and what we want to do, right? We have taken that freedom and taken it a step further than maybe we should. They must remember that their brothers and sisters may die for what they tell them to believe and do. They're going to share with people and say, this is the truth that you need to know. This is the truth that can change your life and, and, and set your eternity in the right direction. But understand, by following, it could mean your life. All Christians must be taught to carry the cross and renounce the self. Soul winners must know and practice this before teaching it to others. Therefore, may we followers of Christ always affirm these words. We will run. Spoken from somebody who lived, that means something. You know? somebody is, is standing up and saying something that, that it doesn't cost them anything, that might not mean as much. But when you have somebody telling you like that, that is living it, it means a whole lot more. Freedom without boundaries with regards to religion has led to so many options of belief, which has led to a moral relativism. As I said, the philosophy of our postmodern society it has also led to a lack of commitment among believers. For instance, <laughs> I jokingly say, you know, I take a long time sometimes, you know, in, in a sermon. And I try to keep it as short as possible, I promise you. <laughs> I promise you. There are things that I cut out 
possibly. And part of you, part of me sometimes thinks, wonders, am I making any sense at all? Because in my head, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I got to take this out, I got to take this out, you know, and and try to, to break it down so that I'm not taking too long. But there should be a level of commitment on your part as a listener and to desire to listen to the word of God that you are committed that whatever God is saying, ever how long it may take, you are ready. You are listening. You're wanting to hear that. Not looking at your watch thinking, man, he's taking cuts at 12 o'clock or, or, or what's for lunch or what am I going to do this week or, you know, so-and-so isn't here and blah, blah, blah. Letting your mind wander. No, Christian, we need to focus and set our minds on what God is saying to us right here, right now. Okay. The church is God's plan A. To reveal His glory, His plan, and His kingdom. The church, whether it be pastors or teachers, other leaders in the church, are to disciple and educate believers on God's plan and His glory in every level of His kingdom which involves the individual, the family, our community, and the world that we live in. This also involves heaven. One of God's value for society rests in the church's ability to carry out her mission of outreach as well. Churches and individual believers must intentionally and strategically look to find ways to reach out to their community. I want, when you come here, to be, there's a sense in which I want you to be both pushed and pulled. I want you to be pulled in and drawn in and, 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 and built up and edified. But then I want to push to go out. To wherever God has led you in our community and the people of your influence, to reach them for Christ if they don't know. Okay? As believers, we must willingly sacrifice our time, our money, our skills, our talent for the benefit of others. You know, I think of Philippians 2.4, you know, it says, look, look not every man on his own interest, but what? Every man also on the what? Interest of others, right? That's the passage that we call the mind of Christ. That is the mindset that we are to have as Christians. It is an other-centered mentality, perspective, okay? If you're sitting here thinking, oh man, you know, the back's going to hurt me and everything's going on and this and that is going on and stuff, that may be true and we can pray for you and, and I appreciate that, but it, but your focus needs to turn toward others rather than yourself. I guarantee you, if you get your mindset on trying to help somebody else, you'll be helped in the process. Like Christ, the church must also meet both the physical and spiritual needs of our society. One time I was asked the question uh, by one of my professors, says, should we give a homeless man a bowl of soup or a Bible tract? What's the answer? Both. Both. Right? Going back all the way to Genesis, how did God create us in His image? Ever how we understand that God created us both as physical and spiritual beings, material and immaterial beings. You have someone that has a physical need. If you are able, meet that need, okay? And sit down, in essence, in this case, give him a bowl of soup, and then sit down and talk to him about the Lord, okay? people will be able to see true religion that pleases and transforms society when we act in such a manner. That's why James chapter 1 uh, verse 27 says what? You should have this verse highlighted in your Bible. If you don't, highlight it. Verse 27 of James 1 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To what? Visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Should be a mindset of reaching out to the others. You know, I'm always reminded, my wife always has got this mentality, every time we come across home, almost some homeless person, she wants to, to help them if she possibly can. 
Uh, and my son has picked up on that mentality as well. And, and he'll sit, we'll be on the uh, driving by and we see some homeless person or whatever, and he, he says, Daddy, you got any money? You know? And he wants to give him whatever money I have. And, uh, and it's just, but it, that's the mindset that we ought to have, right? It's other-centered. But when our culture is in disarray, like we see our society today, believers often respond in one of two ways. They either take an isolationist view, position, or that of a conformist. The isolationist tries to distance themselves from the culture and from unbelievers. It's like my father used to say, he says, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a mean mentality. It's, it's focused on what I am. You know, I found the truth, you know, and I'm just going to keep it to myself. Right? It's too bad that you don't know. I have a mentality. Isolationists tend to preach at others instead of engaging them. They often become legalists and focus on doctrine and biblical precision, but don't take the time to help people outside the walls of the church. Right? It's easy, easy in our society, whether it's in your individual person, you know, what you're dealing with, your family, or your community, or whatever, it's easy to look at everyone else and see all the problems. Right? But what does John say in 1 John 2? Remember that? Right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Where are they? They're in here. So if I don't start with me and get that right, then everything else is going to be, I'm going to be looking, I'm going to be looking out because I want to make you look worse than me. Right? To make myself look better. And it's to tear down. And I might preach at rather than preaching to. It's there that isolationists are like the people in Micah's day. You remember? We talked about Micah 6, 8. They didn't get it, did they? Right? They didn't get it. Or the Pharisees in Jesus' day, where Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7, I won't read it for the sake of time, but look in Mark chapter 7, uh, the first 13 verses or so, I think, uh, and you'll see where Jesus talks to me. He says, by your traditions, by your traditions, everything that you have convoluted and put together to make yourself appear right and, and good, and everybody's looking at it and say, hey, look at me, right? Is by your traditions you made the word of God of none effect. Is it like the lukewarm Christians in the book of Revelation? I just want to spit you out. Right? You're neither cold nor hot. Let's take a look at Romans chapter uh, 12 for a second, which kind of talks about this. And I want you to, if you have a good Bible, you should have it broken down and it. it, it Right before this section that I'm going to read in Romans chapter 12, it talks about a live, being a living sacrifice, how it starts off. We know what verses 1 and 2 so well, and we'll touch on that in a second. But in verses 9 through uh, the end of the chapter, it should have a little section and it says, behave like a Christian. Right? Like that father that tells his son as he starts to go out the door, Remember who you are. Right? Who do you belong to? I want you to read some read with me some of these verses here in, in Romans chapter 12. And we're going to primarily focus on 17 to 21, but I want to read starting in verse 9. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. I want you to do something here I just thought about on your brother Fred when he shared his testimony. Put your name in that in these passages that I go. Okay? Say so this is what I 
should do. Okay? Distributing, verse 13, to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is what? Hungry, feed him. There's true religion. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will reap, uh, heap, reap, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Right? Let God be the one who takes the vengeance, right? If there's something that needs to go wrong that needs to be right, give it to Him. Do what you ought. And in so too, it's like the idea of, of, of putting the burden to the mindset of the people that you're dealing with, so much so that they can't get away from it. It's like burning coals on the head. And that's why it gives you that in for and so doing, you will keep coals of fire on His head. There's an analogy that I, I won't go into there, but that, that's the idea is to give the impression of what they ought to do, or what they're not doing, and let God speak to their heart, okay? Conformists, though, seek to look, talk, and act just like non-believers. Conformists refuse to tell them that the ship is sinking for fear of offending them. That's one reason why we showed this video here, if, if, if that is offensive to you, you know, I, I'm sorry in one sense, but at the same time, I'm not. Because you need to be offended by some of the things that are going on in our society today in regards to education and stuff like that. If you're not, then there's something wrong. Like our friend, one time who, I would say, was kind of a conformist with her own father. He uh, often got together with him. Never, he didn't know the Lord. My father probably knows who I'm talking about when I'm saying this. She'd sit down and have a beer with him and enjoy his company. But she never quite got to sharing the gospel with him and telling the truth about Christ. There's many instances in various ways that that might be true. We conform to our society. Sometimes our family is the hardest ones to reach. Right? And sometimes it may be that God, God brings someone from the outside to be able to speak to them because they might not listen to us. But it may be that God is using you. And you need to ask yourself, am I conforming to the world or am I speaking the truth to them as they need to hear? Conformists tend to get so entangled in the culture that they even forget that the ship is sinking and that there is even a lifeboat. You know, I looked at my father, my son has an infatuation with the Titanic. I don't know what it is, but he has watched every single YouTube video and documentary there is possible on the Titanic. He's nine years old, but he could give you an education on the RMS Titanic. Went down on April 15, 1912, right? And I think there was approximately about somewhere around 2,200 people on that boat. And I was just looking at the statistics on that, and they said of the uh, 2,200 on that boat, about 1,500 of them drowned. Of that 1,500, 700 were crew members. Okay? You can understand that maybe they sacrificed their life for the sake of others. But I looked up the numbers of that. There was of there was um, 714 third-class passengers on that boat. 536 of them died that night. And most of the lifeboats that were used um, went to the first and second-class passengers. And many of the third-class passengers, most of them died. That 
should not it should not have happened in the first place, but it, it just, it's sad that, that that is true. But when I look at this passage here in Romans chapter 12, I also look at verses 1 and 2, and particularly verse 2, in regards to conforming. We know verse 1 so well, which says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what? Your reasonable service. God is not asking you to do something beyond your ability or what he's equipped you to do. Right? So if you're sitting here thinking, well, you know, I just can't do this or that. I mean, we've got the nominating thing coming up. I know uh, in the law and, and Chuck um, should be tell us, you know, we're, we're short on people or this or that. If God has called you to something, then follow, listen, do it. I promise you, God will bless you if you will simply follow. But he goes on in verse 2 and he says, And do not be conformed to this world. Right? Do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed. Right? How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 speaks of a, about a Christian's relationship with culture. And if you are going to serve God with the spiritual gifts that he talks about in relationship verses 9 and following or living a sacrificial life to God, if you are going to do that, you need to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. And I, 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 I preface that sometimes. Like, I, use, I use Titus 1.15 a lot of times in relationship to that because it's a test for how conformed you are to the world because the when something happens, the first thought that runs into your mind, is it pure or is it hot? Okay, Is it good or is it not so good? Okay. Just look at Titus 1.15. I'm not going to go through the test, but put that as a test of, of how conformed am I to the world, okay? Uh, because that will give you a little testimony to that. But also, in regards to this, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explained how the church should live and engage the, the culture. You know, we've been talking, my wife was just talking about my brother-in-law, the church is called Salt and Light, right? And uh, it's taken from Matthew chapter 5. If you turn, uh, if you turn over there if you like, uh, Matthew chapter 5, and uh, where it talks about that we are to be the salt and light, right? How the church is to engage and live in the culture that we are. First, we, he said we are to be salt. What is one characteristic of salt? It's a preservative, right? In the days when they didn't have the refrigeration means or anything like that, they might put salt on things to help preserve them, prolong the life of food. While societies around the world decay and crumble under the weight of immorality, violence, greed, and other things, Christians ought to help preserve society. You know, I thought about this in relationship to, you know, I am pre-tribulational, pre-millennial mindset of my of the end times. That's where I come from. Okay? And, I, and if you're otherwise, you have the right to be wrong. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, I'm joking, but, 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 you know, you can have my car, you can have my house, whatever, you know, you know everything while I'm gone, if you want to stick around. But, but, um, but in relationship to this, what you see is the Spirit of God and the church acting as a preservative in this world that is decaying and falling apart. There comes a point in time, as I see it in the book of Revelation, prior to, just prior to the Christ coming back, where the church will be taken out. And the Spirit of God, on an ongoing basis, will be removed. And the world will be left to run its own course. Right? To face God's wrath and judgment. Okay? And that preservative element of salt in 
in this world will not be present. We are to be that preservative. We are to be that trying to restore, build up, keep what is still good in this world and say, this is the truth. This is what God wants to share with you. I love that story with the video when they, they, they're just simply telling those children whether they can understand their own language or not by the time that Jesus loves you. You know? Jesus loves you. you hear, did you hear that orphan boy? He, he, said that, he said, I realized I was loved and I, I was seen. That's what we're to do. That's what we're to do. Right? Wherever we are, that's what God has called us to do. And we need to get beyond ourselves and our own problems far enough and to think about others enough that we focus on those things rather than ourselves. Just as salt extends the life of food, the way Christians love, serve, and extend grace to others should give non-believers a taste of eternity. That's what makes them want more, right? Not simply preaching at them and saying, you need to you know, get this right and you need to do this and that, right? Don't worry about what else may be going on in a person's life. Focus on their relationship with Christ. Because if God gets a hold of their heart, He'll change all those other things. Okay? Don't get caught up on that. It's similar to like when I, when I tell people about witnessing to Joe's witness. You know, you get caught up on so many legalistic little aspects of things and stuff and everything. And, you know, don't celebrate birthdays and don't celebrate holidays and this and that and everything. You know? And don't take a drug blood transfusion and stuff. Don't get caught up on all that. Okay? It, 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 it serves no purpose in witnessing to them. Focus on who Jesus is and the truth that what He has shared and talk about what He has done in your life and pray that the Spirit of God works in their life as well. And I guarantee you if that takes place, all these other things will come about. And in regards to government, we need to get out and vote. The church can only slow the decaying effects of sin if it gets out into the world. I looked at uh, John chapter 17 in Jesus' prayer, and I want you to look at that real quick for a second. John chapter 17, I apologize, I am taking longer than I thought, but you know, that's just what it is. Uh, John 17. Listen to this. This is Jesus. You want to see Jesus' prayer for someone. This is his actual prayer. Not the model prayer, but this, this is his actual prayer. This is part of it. John 14, or excuse me, 17, verses 14 and 15 and 16. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Can you see that? And I say, if, if there's not a little hate coming your way sometimes, you know, you need to ask yourself, well, I'm not doing something right. Okay? Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Listen to that. Jesus said, I'm, I'm not trying to take them out of the trouble that they're in right now. I put them there for a reason. Okay? But that you should keep them from the evil one. And listen again, verse 16 says, they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. Read that whole chapter. It's really good. Uh, Jesus really did not pray. But uh, I wanted to share with you, though, not only in relation to this, salt can only do its preserving work when someone pours it out. When someone pours it out. And when I looked at when I when I thought of that uh, that analogy of being poured out, I thought of Paul talking about his life being a drink offering, being poured out. And the passage where he talks about it is in 2 Timothy uh, 4, 6, near the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4, in, in, in verse 16 in particular. But he talks about his, his life being poured out. It's near the end. It was an analogy in the Old Testament when they, they did the sacrifice. It was the last offering done before they did the burnt offering. Okay? It was like the end of everything and there's no more. I've given everything that I can. And all I have left is to 
sacrifice my life to Christ, right? And that's what Paul is, in essence, is saying, right? He says, I'm pouring my life out. I'm giving everything. I'm not being complacent. I'm not holding back. I'm not trying to conform. I'm not trying to isolate. I'm trying to do what God has shared the truth with me to do. The other thing is light. Not only to be salt, we're to be light. Jesus said we're to be light. One, one thing light does is drive back the darkness. But if the church refuses to shine in the dark places, uh, whether it's in the government, whether it's in our world, how would the darkness be dispelled? God intends the church to be the solution under his divine leading and rule. We are to be the solution, okay, under his divine leading and rule. And the church should not be in the back, it should be on the front line of the battle. But the values of the kingdom bearing on the culture rather than the other way around. I'm afraid that it's been true for our church as a whole, not necessarily our church, but just churches in general across this country and across the world, is that we have been, the culture has been bearing on us that we have conformed more to it than the other way around. In conclusion, I want to give you a couple things of homework to pray for. Number one is I want you to pray for the Spirit of God. Pray that the Spirit of God will help you and our church live as salt and light in our community. Okay? Live as salt and light. We can only do that if we're poured out. Second thing is to ask the Spirit of God to shift your focus from what is wrong, not only in your life, in your family, in your community, in, in the government, in whatever it may be, from focusing on what is wrong to what you can do to make things right. And then get to work on it. I remember one of my professors telling me, he says, he says, he says, pray as though everything depended upon God, but act as though everything depended upon you. He says, what he meant by that is sometimes we know that God has told us something and we are still on our knees praying about it. We need to get off our knees and do what God has called us to do. If we know that is the case. Yes, we should be in prayer. We, yes, we should take care of things to the Lord. Yes, we should continually be seeking His face and His wisdom on what we have going on in our life and what we have going on around us. But when God has already spoken to us, then we need to get up and do what He's called us to do. We're going to enter into a time of our observance of the Lord's Supper, so if Ben...